ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان الاصدق الكلام كلام الله والخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد حياكم الله الاخوان والاخوات والمستمعين ويقص الله عز وجل that we are going to start this book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides my tongue to that which is correct and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts blessings and alhamdulillah to the mustami'een those who are attending that Allah opens up their hearts and for to understand that which is the correct intent and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ikhlas for verily whatever is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would remain the book that we are going to start is usul al-thalatha the three fundamental principles now normally when you start a book the normal procedure that a talib al-ilm goes through that he gives you the biography of the author of the book and then the individual that is going the explanation that we are using that we give a biography of him but alhamdulillah in this masjid alhamdulillah you are no strangers to that great imam sheikh muhammad ibn abdul wahhab rahimullah and there has been many many biographies that have been done regarding him in this masjid and there is no need for me to repeat that likewise regarding the explanation that i'm using it's not an actual explanation it's it's not a sharh it's not an explanation that sheikh ahmed al najmi rahimullah referred to he referred to as ta'liqat as commentary notes and the intent of that was that it's to give a person a brief understanding what the books are about the book that he was teaching or the books that he's going to give you the ta'liqat for is just to give you a ma'rifa a quick ma'rifa a know how of what the book is about some verses a very simple explanation and that is to encourage individuals for to who are new in seeking knowledge that sometimes that if you start a book and the explanation is so detailed and in so depth that it may be above your head and then sometimes it can be off putting for the individual so the intent of the series of books that we have been doing with the ta'liqat of sheikh ahmed al najmi the intent of that was not a very detailed depth explanation but something just to give you a ma'rifa and understanding of what the book is about and alhamdulillah with that i encourage those who have the ability to try to memorize the text and like we did with all the other books that we have done in the masjid that anyone who wishes to memorize then i encourage that and after every lesson inshallah to the side i will listen to those individuals that have memorized the text so inshallah without any further delay this particular book is not something new to the majority of the individuals that attend this masjid or maybe are listening from the salafis because it is a fundamental book of aqida and tawhid that all the beginning talib al ilm the students of knowledge that is just starting out his studies the ulama have recommended that they start with this book so before me i believe my brother abu talha rahimullah ta'ala did teach this book but he did it in detail mashallah tabarak wa ta'ala and if i'm not mistaken i think that is the last time that book was taught 
So, you are no strangers to what Usul Thalatha is about. Usul Thalatha is basically the questioning that a person will receive regarding the questions in the grave. And that is, مَنْ رَبُّكْ مَا دِينُكْ مَا نَبِيُّكْ أو مَنْ نَبِيُّكْ That who is your Lord, what is your religion, and who is your Prophet. So this is what the book is about. And without any further delay, and one other thing which I will request as well from one of the brothers, that usually we have Abdul Rahman Al-Kanani, who is the reader of the text, but due to the fact I think exams, he was not able to make it. So from what we have learned from the Mashaikh, it is also the Usloob for one of you to read the text. Um, so inshallah, for next week, if we don't have our brother that attends, then one of you inshallah uh, will read the text and then alhamdulillah uh, that will be explained. Qala Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, al-Tamimi rahimullahu ta'ala. I'lam, rahimakumullah, annahu yajibu alayna ta'allamu arba'i masail. Al-Ula, al-ilm. Wa huwa ma'rifatullah wa ma'rifatun nabiyyih wa ma'rifatu din al-Islam bil-adillah. The Shaykh, rahimullah, he began his book by saying, I'lam, no. May Allah have mercy upon you. That is obligatory upon us to learn four matters. And that is the first one, Al-Ula, knowledge. And knowledge, he goes on to explain, and that is knowledge and awareness of Allah, and knowledge of His Prophet, and knowledge of the religion of Islam. That is the rough translation of the text. Now we'll move into the ta'liqat of Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi, rahimullah. Qawluhu, he mentions the Shaykh, I'lam, rahimakumullah. It mentions, no, may Allah have mercy upon you. He said, firstly, that word, I'lam, no. It is something to console and to make someone attend. This whole usloob, the way that these Arabs use when they say, I'lam, no, is to strike a person's attention, to make them attend and aware of that which is about to come. So it mentions that I'lam, that this is, this word no, is to console and to make attend. And that is to make a person alert and attend. And then it mentions afterwards, Rahimakumullah, that may Allah have mercy upon you. And this is a dua. This is a supplication from the author to anyone that will read his work after. That anyone comes and reads this book, that they are receiving this dua from the author. And then he goes on to mention, Annahu yajibu alayna. That it is obligated upon us. And then he mentions who are who is he obligated upon? He mentions a nahnu al mukallifin. Al mukallifin are those individuals who are obligated to carry out the Sharia legislations of Islam. So when you are a mukallaf, meaning that you have now reached the age or you have fulfilled the conditions that all of the orders of Allah have become obligated upon you. It becomes obligatory upon you. This is a mukallif. And that is when, obviously, when you reach the age of adulthood. When you reach the age of adulthood. And that can be done in three ways. That is done either by having coarse pubic hair or by reaching the age of 15 or if one starts to have wet dreams and for the women there's one extra is when they start their menses this is when they become at the age of balugh when they become at the age of adulthood and likewise in fiqh there are other conditions you have to have sanity you have to have islam but generally al-mukallifin are those individuals 
that the legislations of Islam have become obligated upon them. And meaning that if something has become obligated upon them, if they was to carry it out, they receive reward. And if they was to leave off something which is obligated, then they would receive punishment for that. Then the Mu'allif, he goes on to mention, to learn four matters. Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi, he mentions that these four matters that are mentioned, that are obligatory, then they are taken from Surah Al-Asr. And it mentions, in, they are derived and taken from Surah Al-Asr. And the first one it mentions is knowledge. And then he goes on to mention as the definition of knowledge we have received, and that is to know, to have a knowledge and awareness of Allah, and likewise knowledge of his prophet, and likewise the religion of Islam with its proof. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he swears when he starts in Surah Al-Asr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions Wal-Asr by time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time to show you the importance of time. That verily, man is indeed in a state of loss. Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi rahimullah, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears that man is khasir, that, a per, that, a ma, that mankind is in a state of loss and deficient in regarding the hukuk and the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has referred to all of mankind that they are in this state, a state of loss. And that is general for all of mankind. And we cannot make anyone exempt from that, that which Allah has attributed man to, that them being in a state of loss, we cannot make anyone exempt from that, except who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made an exception of. So whoever Allah has made exempt from these characteristics of being in a state of loss is the only ones that we are allowed to say. And then Allah, Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi mentions that who did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make exempt of not being in the state of loss? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except for those who believe. Except for those who believe. Now, the shaykh will bring, because we have taken these four masail from Surah Al-Asr. These four points that we're going to, these Arba masail that we must learn, are taken from Surah Al-Asr. And here it mentions those who believe. So we have to know that from Allah making these individuals, the believers exempt from being in the state of loss, how is that coupled and what is the relation with knowledge? Because it mentions knowledge first. So Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi, he explains. He says, Al-Iman, to have Iman, who wa tasdiq, is to have belief. Wa tasdiq, it mentions, Labud min an yakoon bi shay sabaqa ilma bihi. That if a person has belief in a certain thing, then knowledge must have preceded. If someone has belief in a certain thing, then that means before he believed in that thing, he must have had knowledge that preceded. Knowledge must have reached him first in order for him to have belief in that thing. A, and he goes on to mention, to have faith in something it requires that you believe in it. So if you have faith in a particular thing, then it requires that you have belief in it. And that is to have belief in something which is known. And that is what you have come to know or learned. That is something that you have come to know and learn. So knowledge must precede speech an action. Is, is that clear? If we say 
that something is believed in or you have belief in a particular thing, it means that you must have knowledge before that belief came to you. Belief of something, afwan, knowledge of something which made later became your belief. So the shahid is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, except those who have believed, they only believed because what? Because knowledge came to them. So this is why it is mentioned that it is an obligation for us to have knowledge. And then it mentions, إِذَنْ آمِنُوا بِأَيِّ شَيْءٍ So when in this verse when we mentioned that they believe, what did they believe in? And you answered, they believed in Allah. So now, to believe in Allah, what is to believe in Allah? Awalan, firstly, that we have belief and we have iman in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have belief in the oneness of Allah's lordship. And we have belief and iman in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's worship. The first one, his existence, and likewise in his lordship, that he is the one that governs all of the affairs of the universe and the creation. And the second one, that we single Allah alone in worship. Likewise, the third, and these of course are all categories of what? Tawheed. Al-Iman bi-asma'ihi wa sifatihi wa qawnihi wal-munfarid bi-siyasati hadha al-qawn. That we have belief in the oneness of Allah's beautiful names and attributes. And likewise, that in His creation and in the universe, that Allah alone is in controlling this. That He governs this alone. That He does not have anyone who is equal to Him or anyone who is in partner with Him that is controlling this this universe. And anything of his creation. فَالْعِلْمِ So Sheikh Ahmad mentions, so knowledge was explained by the author with the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for those who believe. And then he explains, يَعْنِي عَلِمُوا وَسَدَّقُوا That they became to know. They learned, they became aware of this knowledge and then they believed. And likewise, the Shaykh Rahimullah, he derives from this verse likewise knowledge. That because they had belief, they must have had knowledge. Why? Because it mentions Amilu, that they acted upon and they believed. They acted upon and they believed the knowledge which they required. فَالْإِلْمَان فَالْإِيمَان مُلْسْتَزِمٌ لِلْعِلْمِ to have faith and to have belief necessitates that you have knowledge of a particular thing. Have to. That you cannot have faith except that it necessitates that you have some form of knowledge. So his statement where it mentions قَوْلُهُ وَهُوَ مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ His statement Explaining knowledge, that is to have knowledge and awareness of Allah. And then he strikes the question. كَيْفَ تَعْرِفَ Allah? How do we know Allah or how do you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Al-Jawab, the answer. مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مِنْ نَعْتَ الْإِجْمَالِيَّةِ تَثَبُّتْ بِالْفِطْرَةِ It mentions the answer. That having knowledge of your Lord and being aware of your Lord in the aspect, in a general meaning, in the general, is established through the fitrah, the natural disposition. That through the fitrah, and this is what the natural disposition of every individual, that the soul which is in a person affirms this. So it mentions here, فَكُلُّ مَخْلُوكٍ يَعْلِمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَهُ 
that every creation knows that Allah is his creator and that Allah created him. And no one denies this. No one denies this. Except for the mulhideen, those who disbelieve. And it mentions regarding them, Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi, he mentions, فَإِنَّهُ يُنْكِرُ فِي الظَّاهِرِ That they may negate the fact that Allah is their creator from ظاهر, that which is from outer and that which is apparent. They may negate it. So they may negate it with their actions and they may negate it with their speech. But it mentions, وَهُوَ فِي بَاطِنِ مُسْتَيْقِنٍ But he, within himself, is certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that has created him. Now, this is where the shaykh finishes regarding Ijmaliyyah. And then he's going to go into the tafsiliyah in a detailed way, of a specific way how you can know Allah. But before we touch upon that, there is a story that I wish to share with you that shares the same point, this exact same point. That I remember on an occasion when I was invited to Venezuela to give dawah. When I went to Venezuela, there was an individual that used to study with us in Medina Munawwara. And he used to give dawah there, so he called us over to aid him in the dawah. And I don't know if you know that Venezuela is a very, very, very strong country that is following the Catholic way of Christianity. And they are very, very passionate in their belief. So on an occasion, when we were giving dawah, and we were explaining the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the question came around because in Venezuela what they do, they build statues of Mary and statues of Jesus. And they are everywhere, even on the roadsides, you, you'll find one. And then you'll find that people are making dua by these, these, these statues. So on an occasion, when we were talking about Tawheed, we mentioned regarding the statues that you do not need to call to the statues that which you have built with your own hands. It will not benefit you and it will not harm you. Rather call to the one that has created you. And their answer to that was, was the same answer as what the Mushrikeen of Quraysh said to the Messenger Sallallahu Wasallam. That we do not worship these idols, but rather we only get close by requesting from the idols and they will be like in between or intercessors for us in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they said the same thing. That we know we don't actually worship these statues. But it's just a means to get closer to Allah. So then I said to one individual that I want to ask you a question. And if you are truthful, then we will come to some kind of natija and some result. I said, have you ever, ever come close to death? And he said to me, yes, I have. On an occasion, he said to me that I was in a car crash and I lost control of the car and I thought that the car wasn't going to stop and I was going to die. I said, Billah alayk, truthfully, at that time, did you call to these statues that were on the side of the road for aid? Or what did you do exactly? And he said, to be truthful, I don't know why, but I looked up towards the sky and I was saying, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, save me. So when the time came, when he was in real need, in real need, then they own, the fitrah only turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, this example was taken obviously from in the Qur'an, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an, when the kuffar are out at sea, and a heavy storm comes and they are doomed and they're about to die, then they call sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for aid. At that time, they don't disbelieve. At that time, they don't associate any partners in the call. The call is for Allah alone. And then Allah answers their call, and when they get back to a shore, then they end up disbelieving again. So this is an example, Ikhwan, that the natural disposition, the fitra, knows who his creator is. Then we move on, ma'rifatullah bi tafsil, that knowing Allah and having knowledge of Allah in detail, in a specific way, and it mentions this second type of knowledge of Allah, this detailed knowledge of Allah, that this is not possible, except 
by way of the prophets. The prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to Bani Adam, to the sons and the children of Adam. And then the Shaykh he quotes a verse. Ya Bani Adam, imma yatiyannakum rusulun minkum yaqussunu alaykum ayati faman ittaqa wa aslaha fala khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahsanun. A proof regarding this principle and what I would want from the brothers and from the sisters that when we are going to now quote these verses and you will know the references and obviously you know the understanding or you will know the translation but what is also required my brothers and sisters that you know the shahid you know that why this verse is a proof for the particular point that we are mentioning this is what you should start doing because I remember our ulama used to mention that it is not enough for you to merely know a proof. You must know why it is a proof. You must understand and that is what is fiqh. That is fiqh of the deen. That you have understanding of the deen that when you see these verses or a hadith then you know why they are a proof. So here the proof that we are the shahid is, what we are saying is, you cannot know the second type of knowledge with Allah, which is the detailed tafsil of Allah, except by way of the prophets. And now there's a proof coming to explain that. And that is a rough translation, O children of Adam, if there comes to you messengers from amongst you, reciting to you my verses, then whomsoever becomes pious and righteous on them, shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. So this is a clear proof that the knowledge has to come by way of the prophets. Then, therefore, the knowledge and the awareness of Allah in detail, لا يمكن لأحد It is not possible for anyone to acquire that knowledge except by way of the prophets and peace and blessings be upon them. And likewise, وَقَدْ جَاءَ فِي شَرِيَتِنَا And that which has come in our sharia by way of the book of Allah and the sun of the messengers alayhi wa sallam is sufficient. And likewise, it is a cure for us. So that which has come by way of the prophets and in our case, which is but the Quran and the sun of the messengers alayhi wa sallam is sufficient for us. And likewise, a cure for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made clear in His book that which He revealed down to His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is the Qur'an. And the Qur'an has explained bayyana fihi kullu shay. That the Qur'an has explained everything. And from amongst the things that are explained, وَأَعْذَمُ شَيْ فِيهِ وَأَحَمُّ مُحَمَّاتِ and from the things that I've explained, from the most important of the fears, the most important things is to have knowledge of Allah, is to have knowledge and awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have known through Allah informing us regarding His self, that which Allah has informed us regarding. He signs a qawniya and likewise ayatihi al quraniya They are two types of signs, my brothers and sisters. Qawniya is those signs that we have in the creation. Signs for people of understanding that are in the creation of Allah that indicate that there is a creator like the sun, the moon, the way the day and night alternates. The mountains, the way the sky is fixed high, the sea, the river, all of these are signs for people of understanding regarding the existence of a creator. And then likewise, we have the signs which are the verses of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُمْسِكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَنْ تُزُولًا وَلَئِنْ زَالَتَ إِنْ أَمْسَكُهُمَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ 
innahu kana haliman ghafura Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions in the Quran verily Allah grasps the heavens and the earth lest they should move away from their places and if they were to move away from their places there is not one that could grasp them after truly he truly he is ever most forbearing and oft forgiven here is a clear proof that this is the signs of of qawniya where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions regarding the heavens and the earth that all of this it is mentioned it is in the grasp of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then it goes on to mention in the next verse وَمَا قَدَرَ اللَّهُ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ وَالْعَرْضُ جَمِيعًا قَبْدَتُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ مَتْوِيَاتٌ بِيَمِينِهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, they made not a just estimate of Allah, such as which is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the day of resurrection, the whole of the earth, will be grasped by his hand, and the heavens will be rolled up in his right hand. Glorified is he, and high is he, above all that which they associate as partners with him. Subhanallah. So it mentions, إِلَى غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ And there are other than these verses, that indicate and show us, what we know of Allah, that which he has explained regarding himself. And this is another principle, Ikhwan. This is something not which Shaykh Ahmed has mentioned, but regarding what I am saying is that Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, when it comes to Allah, then we do not say anything from our own selves regarding Allah. When we explain our Lord and His attributes and His names, we only say that which Allah has described Himself with, or that which His Messenger Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has described him with. Other than that, we stop. We don't go beyond. We don't go beyond that which Allah has informed us of himself. And likewise, his messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, in this verse, it mentions, سُنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْعَفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيْنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِي بِرَبِّكَ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, we will show them our signs in the universe and in their own selves until it becomes manifest to them that this, the Quran, is the truth. Remember we mentioned that when these verses come, we should know why it is a proof. Where is the shahid here? What is, what, what is the subject matter here? Why is, why is Shaykh Ahmad and Najmi Relaying this verse now. What is the subject matter? So I know that we're all on one level. Qawniya. That these verses are showing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala signs in his creation. And it mentions that we will show them our signs in the universe. And in their own selves. What is the tafsir and the understanding of own selves? Huh? Likewise in the fitrah, and likewise in our creation ourselves, the human body. For verily it is a sign for those who have understanding. Until it becomes manifest to them that this Quran is the truth. Is it not sufficient in regards to your Lord that is a witness over all things? Even, so Shaykh Ahmad, he goes on to explain. So now we know our Lord with that which he has explained regarding himself. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, 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 is present in his essence and likewise in his attributes and that verily he is the true Lord. Alaykum salam. That he is the true Lord. And it becomes upon, it is yambagi, that we single Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in worship. And throughout this, what we have just mentioned, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above His magnificent throne. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is separate 
and distinct from his creation. Meaning that Allah is not mixed with his creation. It is not mixed within the creation. That Allah is ba'in min khalqihi. That Allah is separate and distinct from his creation. Wa ilmuhu bi kulli makan. And that his knowledge is in every place. Meaning that Allah's knowledge will reach everything. That he has knowledge of all things. This, my brothers and sisters, is Tawheed. When we truly understand what our Lord is capable of regarding his Tawheed and his names and attributes, Wallahi, it makes an abd realize and it makes it easier. This is why they say the more knowledge a person has, then the more that he has fear of his Lord. And this is why they say that verily the ulama are the ones that truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the ground knowledge they have regarding Allah's tawheed, the names and attributes. Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi, rahimullah, he goes on to mention and that we know that the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone in the characteristics of creating. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates he is alone with this. And the sifat and the attributes of sustaining, sustaining his creation, likewise, he is alone with that as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse, he mentions, أَمَّنْ هَذَا الَّذِي يَرْزُقُكُمْ إِنْ أَمْسَكَ رِزْقَوْ بَلْ لَجُّوا فِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, Allah the Most High, he says, Who is he that can provide for you if he should withhold his provisions? Nay, or rather, but they continue to be in pride and they flee from the truth. A clear proof here that Shaykh Ahmad brings the shahid is, that is, Allah alone is the one that sustains his creation. Likewise, it mentions, وَعَرَفْنَا بِمَا عَرَفْنَا بِأَنَّ نَفْسِهِ أَنَّ لَهُ أَسْمَى الْحُسْنَى And he said, we know that which we know, that which Allah has explained regarding himself, that he has beautiful names, and he has the most perfect attributes and lofty and exalted attributes. And Allah is the highest in his essence. And Allah is highest in the ability and power. And he is far high in his domination. He is the one that is dominating over his creation. So after this, فَهَذِهِ مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ This is what we refer to as knowledge and awareness of Allah. This is what we call مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ that having knowledge and awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالنَّتِيجَةُهَا So then Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi then he says, so what is the result of this? This knowledge of your Lord. The knowledge of your Lord is Tawheed and likewise his names and his attributes. Once a person knows this, then the result of that is ifraduhu bil ibadah that you will single Allah alone in worship. You will single Him out alone in worship, in all aspects of worship, whether it is in supplication, whether it is making dua, or whether it is having fear of Allah, or having hope in Allah, and other than that, you will single Allah alone in worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Qur'an, وَلَا تَدْعُوا مَا اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ هَالِكٌ إِلَّا وَجْهَهُ لَهُ الْحُكْمُ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise commands this tawheed. And Allah, He says, and invoke not any other ilah, meaning no other God that you will ascribe with Allah, along with Allah, None has the right to be worshipped but he. Everything will perish save his face. He is the decision and to him 
all shall be returned. So here, my brothers and sisters, after mentioning what is knowledge of Allah and awareness of Allah, and some of the aspects of Tawheed, we have now mentioned the natija. We have now mentioned the result of this. So that was the first part. Thaniyan. Ma'rifatun nabiyyihi. To have knowledge of his messenger. And that is, Ma'rifatun nabiyyi bi'annahu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَأَرْسَلُهُ إِلَى النَّاسِ جَمِيعًا لِيُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ To have awareness and knowledge of the Prophet is to establish that he is the messenger of Allah and that he was sent to mankind, all of mankind, not to a particular people, but to all of mankind. He is the last messenger. To take them out of darkness and bring them to the light, which is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Tawheed and the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he goes on to mention all of this requires for a Muslim to have belief in this. Al Iman alati yu'minu biha al Muslim. That I, the belief and the faith that a person has, طيب, it requires this. A person cannot have belief except that he establishes that the Messenger Muhammad وسلم, is the final messenger. You cannot have any form of belief if you do not establish this. This is why you will find that the Messenger وسلم, has said regarding the Jews and the Christians that there, there is not a Jew or a Christian, except that he will hear about me and reject me, except that his final abode and destination will be the hellfire. You cannot establish iman except to have belief and to affirm that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the final messenger. Third, Thalithan. Ma'rifatu deen al-Islam bil adilla. To have Knowledge of the religion of Islam with its proof and evidence. A, it explains. بِأَن تَعْرِفْ بِأَنَّ هَذَا حُكْمُهُ wajib. Regarding the knowledge of Islam and likewise its proof, it mentions that you should know its verdict. These evidences in Islam, you should know the evidence is um, the hukma, the verdict of that, whether it is obligatory and its proof. And likewise, whether its verdict is haram, unlawful. And likewise, its proofs regarding that too. And likewise, that if it is recommended, mustahab, and likewise, its proof. And then he goes on to mention, likewise, the verdict one the verdict if it is disliked. Basically, all of the verdicts and the legislations, the ahkam of halal wal haram, you should know this with the evidences. And if something is permissible or not. And it's proofs. So this is why they say, وَلِهَذَا قَالُوا فِي أُسُولُ الْفِقْ That when in the science, when they are studying usul al-fiqh, that when it came to the definition of fiqh, when it comes to the definition of fiqh, they give the definition that fiqh is to have awareness and understanding and knowledge of the sharia, the verdicts of the sharia with its detailed proof. So I repeat, fiqh, in usul al-fiqh, the definition has been given to have knowledge and awareness and understanding of the legislations of the Sharia with its detailed proofs. And inshallah, <clears throat> on that note, we'll round off. Inshallah, we won't prolong too much. Um, what I request from the brothers and the sisters that you go over your notes and likewise try to understand 
why the verse is a shahid. That why is it a proof? So perhaps inshallah next lesson before we start, not only will we ask for those individuals that have memorized, but then we may ask you questions like why is this verse a proof? Or what is this verse a proof of? And I strongly recommend those individuals that do have the ability to memorize, try to memorize the text. It will indeed help you with your understanding as well. And do not be put off by Usul uh, Thalatha being pages and pages long. Start somewhere. Even if you memorize a line, or even if you memorize two or three words, it's not a problem. Then the following day, you memorize another two or three words. And then the following day, another two or three words. And before you know it, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you and you will have, Alhamdulillah, quite a lot of nusus memorized. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best.